Hello and welcome to True Crime Rocket Science, the most authentic voice in true crime. How long would you say it takes for criminal psychology to to brew, to percolate, to to marinate? How long does that process take place? What is the turnaround time for a premeditated murder? Quite a complicated question, right? Now, assuming one has a perfect storm of stresses and tensions and anxieties, how long does it take for the criminal mind to ready itself for action? It has been pricked into action. There's been this uh, little glimpse of what the perpetrator wants to do. And from then on, he's sort of tempted. He's toying with this idea of what he wants to do. Now, it might seem like a very complicated question, but in the Chris Watts case, we saw him go from mild-mannered, perfect father and ideal husband to a homicidal maniac in about five to six weeks. I mean, even his wife said she couldn't recognize the man that she'd married. And that whole process took about five to six weeks. If we take the first date referenced in the Washington State University termination letter, September 23rd, 2022, which is a Friday, right? Then it's seven short weeks until the night of the incident, Saturday going on Sunday, the 13th of November. In other words, it appears criminal psychology has sufficient time to fester from a stable baseline to homicidal in as little as two months. Before we get to the rest of this episode, we we're going to talk about Koberger following a female Washington State University student to a car. Before we get to that, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do. If you are interested, if you've grown to like this channel and you're interested in our journey, you can look at a live that I've just put up where we talk about our 10-year journey writing 100 books, many, many blogs, and the ups and downs of the roller coaster ride that is the true crime journey so check that out i'll put a link uh, to that in the description if you're enjoying this episode please like share leave a comment you can also hit the thanks button and let's get started so you know in some when you talk about this whole idea of Koberger following a female student to a car and then apparently someone complained about that what we are dealing with is yet another incel incident. I don't think it takes rocket science to see to what extent Koberger fits the incel profile, even if he didn't actually identify with the group. But the latest new insight that he followed a female WSU student to her car shows yet another blunder, you know, with the opposite sex from Koberger. Although it was reported Right, although it was escalated to, I guess, his professors, it appears that Koberger was ultimately let off the hook in that particular instance. It could be that the complaint against him was unfair or that because Koberger was the black sheep, anything he did or, or if he did something, um, they didn't really want to cut him any slack. Um, not as much as if, let's say, somebody else did something similar. In any event... We see Koberg is clearly trying to engage. There's so many instances of him in a social setting. He's trying, he's looking at someone, he's talking to someone, he's having some other interaction with someone, might be his neighbor. And effectively what he's trying to do is make friends. He's far from home. He's by himself. He's in a social setting. He's trying to socialize. He's doing really what he should be doing is trying to get his social life into gear and on the road, and yet at every turn, he seems to screw it up. So was he trying too hard? Had he been alone for too long and, and had kind of become unsocialized? Was it a cultural issue? Or was Koberger simply not sufficiently socialized overall? Uh, or was he just a jerk, uh, somebody with very you know, needed to have polysocial skills. Now, we do, do know that he, he had friends in high school, so it's not that he was um, object, uh, completely objectionable that literally no one on this planet could see themselves hanging out with him. But one wonders whether the pandemic perhaps worsened 
is already rusty social awkwardness. And that then brings us to the trigger. Bad teacher gate was undoubtedly the trigger in this case, specifically what had to be the humiliating spectacle of being roundly criticized, shot down by 75 students. That's a lot. That's a lot of people saying not very nice things about you, right? And possibly in front of other professors as well. And perhaps the other professors felt this is, let's teach him a lesson. And this is a lesson we want uh, to teach him. So effectively, he was in front of an audience of about 150 people. That is quite a spectacular social death to experience in a social setting. To have virtually everyone in his faculty um, watch him sort of burn out, burn down, burned at the stake, bur burnt at the um, sort of social stake in terms of his um, direction of study. And not only that, you, if you can imagine uh, the uh, discrepancy here, the contradiction of what he's going through, he's, he's kind of being undone, right? He's being, um, he's experiencing this humiliating thing within the context of the fun house. Well, what's happening there? Well, you have another 150 kids turning up, having fun, enjoying themselves, having the experience they want, compared to Coburg's experience of university, which is not fun. I think the issues surrounding Bad Teacher Gate simply made it even more triggering. So Bad Teacher Gate, I think, was a huge trigger, that, that incident where he was criticized. But I think the issues around that, the altercations with the lecturers, this, that, and the next thing, made it even more triggering. It made it hard to let go of what had happened to him. Hard to forget, hard to get over, just as Nutgate was something Shanann didn't let Chris Watts think about. And so you have this very negative experience that is repeated, reinforced, and the perpetrator, the perpetrator reminded of it. And doesn't that then cause this percolating of the criminal psychology? In the Chris Watts case, even during the week that he spent in North Carolina, Shanann made sure that he was fully aware of how his mother almost killed their daughter. And so he was starting to think certain thoughts. That kind of thing would reinforce those thoughts. Could you not have had a similar situation with um, Brian Koberger? Now, on News Nation, covering this aspect, former FBI agent uh, Jennifer Coffendaffer, she told the host, Ashley Banfield, this would not answer why he did this, right? She acknowledged that bad teacher gate could have triggered Koberg, but she kind of said that it would not answer why. It doesn't answer why? I think it does. It's because in the university setting, where everyone seems to be gratuitously enjoying um, social and other forms of intercourse, effortlessly, easily, he's having a torrid time, he's having a very different experience. Not only can he not get laid, not only do his PhD peers not like him, not only do the professors not like him, not only can he not make friends, not only do his neighbors treat him like the play, not only do the students at the student union in Moscow go and sit somewhere else when he's around, but added to that, you've got the humiliation of younger students putting him in place. It's triggering in the context of the university setting. It's triggering in the context that it's a classroom setting that brings back bad memories of high school. But I think it also triggers him to his core. Once again, he feels bullied. He feels humi humiliated. He feels emasculated. He becomes ostracized. Uh, and to have the faculty make that official hurts even more. So I think it... It sort of feels like it's him against the entire world. And I think it very much does answer why. I think at this point, if the why is unclear, it's because one has either an incomplete idea of, of Koberger or a fragmented view of Koberger. And I think if you've imagined him all along as a serial killer, well, you haven't really imagined him at all. Interestingly, just as there's been 
um, superficial, slight uh, improvements in the, you know, in terms of the timeline of the Watts case, just as you sort of saw um, some slight improvement in, in Chris Watts's marriage where he claimed that he was going to uh, get marriage counseling, right? He said that he would read a book and, and so on. Um, you had that improvement taking place just prior to catastrophe. Koberger also apparently showed s slight signs of making an attempt to fix the situation. But all of this was after the incident. According to News Nation, quote, and this is quoting from the uh, termination letter, quote, we met again on December 7th, that's three weeks after the crime, um, this time with Professor Snyder as well as Dr. Willits and I. So he's meeting with one, two, three professors to discuss his progress. And they, they decided, although he's not doing a great job, he has, there was some progress. So one kind of gets the sense that after the incident, after that emergency venting, he seemed to calm down and feel better about himself and feel more in control and feel more positive about everything. It does make one wonder, did Koberger ultimately lose his scholarship or PhD status over bad teacher gate and the altercations? One does wonder, will Koberger be able to complete his PhD from jail? Would he want to? I suppose perhaps he can write a thesis on himself. So I'm not going to take it further than that. I will be doing two follow-up episodes on the Nicola Bully case. First of all, dealing with how, how should you search for someone in water? And then secondly, we're going to analyze Paul Ansel's interview with Channel 5. Are there any red flags there? Where does that interview take us? He also talks about when he calls, the first time that he calls his partner of 12 years on the day that she went missing. So look out for that. Thank you for listening and I'll see you guys next time.